Let's go. What's up, guys? Welcome to this episode of Beers and Breakdowns. In this episode, we are doing a super, super sick movie. It's called The Sniper, The Sniper, White Raven. Or is it Sniper, The White Raven? Ugh, words. This movie is awesome, and they did a great job at it. Obviously, it's even more intense knowing what is going on now with Russia invading Ukraine. And this was a few years ago. I think it was probably... This came out right at the beginning of Russia, like threatening to go into Ukraine. So it's just even more impactful now. So this is uh, obviously a very Ukraine nationalist movie, but I think Ukraine should be proud of what they're doing. And I think you sh Ukraine should be uplifted, uh, especially for what they're going through with Russia right now. So even more a reason to watch this movie. Real quick guys, Barbell Apparel. If you guys don't know, we currently have a collaboration with them going on right now called the Chase Fear Collaboration, where you can get shorts, t-shirts. You guys are going to see a video play after this. So you guys can actually get a oh, good so view of that from Kurt himself. Um, are you wearing one? No, I'm wearing the Navy SEALs collaboration of it, Barbell. <laughs> Representing for the Berets. Yeah, but, hey, uh, this is not a Navy SEAL shirt. Ignore this. Anyway, one of the reasons that we really enjoy working with Barbell Apparel is not only because of the great apparel, obviously, but because they offer an insane lifetime guarantee. If you gain weight, meaning you gain muscle and get bigger, or you lose weight and reach your goal weight, or if you just change over time from when you bought the clothes, they will send you new clothes to fit you, no questions asked, which I think is pretty insane. Top of that, if anything happens, they have great customer service. They'll take care of you right away if you have any issues with the current clothes that maybe you've just purchased. Um, hoodies are on sale right now, and that's, I'm wearing one of them. Uh, I'm wearing one in the last video too. I love these very, very much. I feel like I'm just kind of wearing a shirt. It doesn't really feel like a hoodie, but it does keep me warm. And uh, I, <laughs> if you can't tell, I'm not fit. It's not what I do, okay? I focus on other stuff, but... He's getting there. So if you think that you have to be like just one of these shredded dudes, one of these influencers, right? You don't oh, have, thanks. Thanks you for don't have to be thanks one of those people uh, in order to enjoy the clothes from Barbell. Uh, to be quite honest with you, pants have not fit me quite as well as Barbell pants have, and now all of my pants are Barbell, and obviously... I need I'm, to... Wait a minute. Sh I need to say something. But what? I need to say... We need to test their return policy. And if you accidentally ordered a Navy SEAL shirt like this one, and you meant to order a Green Beret one, <laughs> like the Chase Fear line, you need to let them know, hey, you need to take this back and take a Chase Fear instead. There may be a time discrepancy on that uh, yeah. in terms of when you order this Navy yeah, SEAL and flag. Yeah, and when they say, what makes you think that we would trade your shirt in? Be like, I watched the FNG Academy, and they said that you would do it. So, all right, send these Navy SEAL shirts back and request Chase Fear. Dude, could you imagine? <laughs> I get the angriest email from Barbell tomorrow. It'd all the like, shirts. I would love it if they started sending back shirts from the Navy SEAL. Don't get me wrong, that Navy SEAL, that Chad dude, he's cool as shit, dude. He's awesome. So, I'm not trying to, I'm just joking. That, but that would be really funny. <laughs> like, people are sending their shirts back. Stop with the commercial. Don't do that to Barbell. Don't do that to Barbell. <laughs> They're good to us. Good to us. But again, just ending that off. If you guys really want to support the channel, of course, like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. We do appreciate it. But if you really want to support us even more, go a little bit further. Please check out the Chase Fear line. We greatly appreciate it. <laughs> Any subtitles? Watching this scene, it, it makes me think about like the steps, right? We all watch this and we're like, oh, that's what we would do. We would start training. If we had a, a outside country trying to invade our country, hmm. we would start training, right? But that's not the hard part. The easy part is training people. I could go to my neighborhood right now and go outside and be like, hey, if you're a military aged fighter mm -hmm. and you want to fight, come meet me over here and we'll start training. Mm -hmm. I'll get my guns out. I'll get, you know, targets set up. We could start doing uh, weapons teardowns. We could do tactics. We could start moving through the neighborhood. I could teach them, you know, how to, to do uh, um, assaults. We could do all kinds of infantry tactics training. That's not the hard part. The hard part in these situations is always intel. 
Mm. Intelligence is where that's what it all comes down to because you could train this force all you want, but if you don't know how to employ them, where to employ them, how to you know disrupt the enemy force, where they're trying to evade, what their goals are, how to interrupt those goals, intelligence is everything. So if you were, if we were to do this in our country, God forbid, we have to become Ukraine and an outside force wants to invade us. A lot of us are going to get together and some of us special operations guys are going to split off for training cells. And we're going to start training civilians to shoot, move and communicate. That's going to be a primary goal. You know, you're going to have a couple green berets per whatever area. But then a couple of us are going to have to split off and we're going to be purely intelligence and intelligence gathering. So we're going to find civilians with drones. We're going to find civilians that are pilots. We're going to find um, and then we're going to start putting together civilians for the intelligence sector. Hmm. So essentially we have to recreate everything that the military has with the civilians and the assets they have. So if you're a civilian and you think like, oh, I'm not military. I've never been military. I don't know anything. B.S. Everybody knows something. If you're a civilian and you have radio experience, you're going to be the comms guy in this scenario. If you fly planes, you're going to be intelligence gathering in this scenario. If you're a shooter, you're a hunter, you're a shooter for us. Now you're going to be transitioned into a sniper. So everybody that has any kind of experience as a civilian sector is then going to be brought in and we're going to train you to use that in a military form to protect our country. Hmm. So essentially... It sucks to think about, but Ukraine had to think about it and Ukraine had to do it. There may be a time when, you know, Americans have to come together and say, we have to defend ourselves yeah. from an invading force. Push your lead. Ну що ж, поздравляємо рядового ворона. 18 секунд. So, obviously the the sniper team is looking for volunteers. They overlooked him because he's a pacifist and he was uh, you know, a hippie before his his wife was killed. And so he is a little extra, right? He stands up in front of everybody and says, "I'll assemble and disassemble the AK-47." which I'm, I'm pretty sure it's an AK platform, but I don't know if it's an AK-47. So I'll disassemble, assemble the AK um, within 20 seconds. And then just as a little extra, he puts his blindfold on, mm. just a show-off point. There's been times in my career where, in my military career, especially when you know I wanted to work for the sergeant major and I knew that he wasn't going to give me the job, where I had to be a little over the top. Mm. And when you feel confident in your skills and you know that you've worked harder than everybody else to get that and that you're the right person, sometimes you got to shoot your shot and you, you can't be afraid to like be a little over the top. So I just respect that in this scene, he's like way over the top where he's like, oh, I'll do it in 20 seconds. And it's like, that's already a huge task for these guys. And then he does it blindfolded. He's just putting on a little bit of a show. Yeah. But he's letting them know, I've worked really hard for this. I've trained for this. I'm ready. And now's my chance to get the opportunity to be a sniper instead of a, you know, a grunt. Like I get to be essentially for them is like special operations to, to go be a sniper. Yeah. He, t he, see he saw an opportunity and he seized it. Right. And that is exactly what you need to do if you want to be special operations. One of the guys, and I've, I've told this story before, but he was in – Selection. He was out at land, uh, land nav at night. His buddy came up to him and was like, hey, man, how you doing? And he was like, good, dude, how are you? And he's like, good, man, have a good trip. Hopefully you make it. And walks off, and he's like, oh, that was cool. Goes to grab his uh, rubber ducky, his rifle, and it's gone. So his buddy that he thought was his buddy stole his rifle. Oh, man. So his career is essentially over. So what does he do? He land navs back to the cadre hut and then sneaks in and steals one of the cadre rifles from the pile of quitters. So every time you quit, you turn in your pile of rubber ducky. You turn right. your rubber. So there's a pile of rubber duckies that aren't accounted for 
because the quitters all stacked him up. Right. So he's not stealing it from anybody else. He's not hurting anybody else. So he landnaz back to the cadre hut and takes one of those rubber duckies and then landnaz back to his point, finishes, gets all his points, gets selected, becomes a Green Beret. Yeah, that's awesome. That's thinking outside the box. That's doing what you got to do. Sometimes you got to be a little extra. How'd you find out about that? Did everybody find out about that? Yeah, he told us after. Oh, okay. But like on the spot, that other guy didn't get like any He issues? wouldn't tell anybody. That's another integrity thing about oh, this okay. particular individual. He didn't snitch him out. Ah. 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 It's painful. One thing that my team sergeant told me, which I held on to, and as much as we didn't see eye to eye, he's a smart dude, mm-hmm. and he's a, a an amazing trainer. Uh, and one of the things he told me in Afghanistan and told our team was never jump off a vehicle. Yeah. I was like, you guys are operators. You're fit. You're here. You're trained. You're here to fight. We got a mission to do. The last thing you need to do is be having kit on and backpacks and jumping off vehicles, and then you bust a knee, bust an ankle. It just sounds stupid. It's just dumb. Because if it's not off of a truck, anything that high, and you just saw me standing there and I decided to jump off of it, you'd be like, why did you do that? Right, why? If you screwed yourself up right now, you'd screw all of us. Right. Be like, yeah, so it makes sense. Why would you jump off? They're like jumping over the tailgate and like landing on the ground. Yeah. Never do that. Never jump off things. I took that to heart when he said that, and like I've to this day, I don't do it. I don't jump off anything. But out of the back of an ambulance, if I'm doing EMT stuff, well, so I'm in EMT training for my third time. Uh, like jumping at anything. If I'm doing any kind of training, if you're valuable to that mission, to that organization as an asset at all, don't get hurt over something stupid. Like jumping off something in kit and then busting your knee and now you're out. Because, again, the smaller the team is, the more important each individual gets. And then all of a sudden your medic's gone because he jumped off a vehicle and that guy could have saved your life. So I love that. I love that. There's Star Wars nerds everywhere. I know. Even in Russia. Well, the Is it pew 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 pew? It's all slightly off. It's You're like, it's something like that. Yeah, it's close enough. I just I thought that was awesome, dude. Minus. 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 So that's kind of weird and also not fair. It's it makes perfect sense if you think about it. What do you think? He's training them to do. Uh, well, stay still under fire, right? So if a bullet lands and you're trying to take your shot to not like react, the reason I say not fair is because obviously the first guy is going to be the most surprised, and then as it moves on, you can almost time how long it's going to take him to shoot, and the fact that you're used to the noise. The 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 time and the anticipation would make it worse for some though. That's true. Because when you're waiting for it and then it happens, you're going to twitch even more. The only way to beat that that flinch test is uh-huh. not to try and time it or to th- it's to accept if it if i get shot i get shot mm. you have to sit there and say if a if a bullet hits me then fine if a bullet hits me then fine i accept it so that way you're not worried about your arm sticking out you're not worried about anything else you're saying i accept getting shot okay and that's the only way you're going to defeat that because otherwise you're like it, no matter what it, if if I'm going to come up to you and then everyone's going to get a fake punch. Right. But someone's going to get a real one, but you don't know who it is. Right. So 
Right, but I would have to like I, what I'm saying is like I find comfort in repetition, so I would know well the th- the other three people haven't been shot, so I know I'm not going to get shot. So I almost feel like it almost be easier for me to accept that I'm not going to get shot, or vice versa, right? To be able to be able to tell myself on, if yeah. I got shot, I was fine, knowing the other guys that have failed, he's, they're not going to shoot anybody. Clearly, now I know that for sure because yeah. it's happened three times now. And all that's happened is the guy's shot next to me. Obviously, they're not going to kill anybody. So that intrusive thought that I might actually get hit sort of goes away. But in that training environment, you start to realize that they would shoot you. Mm. They would, they would like, graze you at least. Okay. Or a ricochet could hit you, yeah. and they do it on accident. But what if it was in the kind of the punching thing I was getting at? Yeah. Is what if the flinching thing was you, instead of you thinking, I'm not going to get hit, I'm not going to get hit, I'm not going to get hit. What if you just said, let him hit me? I don't right. give a damn. Yeah. The minute you say, let him hit me, it doesn't matter. You're expecting the full contact. Yeah. So once the full contact doesn't happen, you didn't flinch because you're like, hit me. I don't give a damn. Now you could ex- you could accept that f- without any kind of flinch because you're just waiting for the hit. Yeah. So to me, that mindset that he's developing is, let him shoot me. But until... Until I'm out of the fight, I'm in it, and I'm going to get my shot off. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. So I, I just thought that it's really good training. And they didn't make it like super hua where it was like unrealistic. It's He's shooting perfectly safe next to him. Yeah. But you're still having a round snap off next to you. Yeah. It's going to be terrifying. To get that close in that position would take all night long. Hmm. So it's a super, super, super slow movement uh, to get that close to an objective. But using your terrain is going to dictate, right? So terrain dictates tactics. They have this, like, I don't know what it is, poppy field or whatever that, like, field that they're in. Uh Uh-huh. But in order to get through that without being heard, you're not going to walk through that in the middle of the day. Obviously, yeah. Obviously. Someone's going to see that thing moving. You're going to hear the noise. So all night long, literally, you probably start the minute the sun goes down, and all night you're going to be creeping, creeping, creeping just to get closer and closer and closer. So that way when the sun finally comes up, and that's why in the U.S. military we do stand to, where we stand to at the minute the sun starts to peak, Mm -hmm. we're all stand to, we're all on guard. Because that's when these guys are going to be in position and initiate their ambush. So we're hedging our bets that if somebody creeped up on us all night long, now's the time they're going to attack that's why we do stand to, and we're all in a security position waiting for that attack at dusk. Right. So it's all for a reason, right? Um, and that's what is happening here. Clearly now they're in position, which is taking place at day, but uh, would have been all night long. Uh, and then we'll see what happens. But the reason that this young guy gets picked up as an AG to the lieutenant colonel's advanced sniper is because he what used to be, um, you know, Mikola used to be a physics teacher. Okay. So he could he could do distances like that. Hmm. So like complex distances he could calculate in his head instantly. Uh-huh. So he's like a, a human computer. A, a range finder, a human range finder. Yeah. That's so cool. instead of having, you know, the range finder, they have him. So that's why he got picked ahead. And then this is what happens. So go ahead, play.
That was just a sick ambush. That dude. was sick. Yeah, that went to so plan. So cool. According to plan, they had the assaulting force. They had uh, like almost like secondary snipers. So you had the main snipers off on a distance, and then you had your secondaries who were just suppressed mm-hmm. to take follow-on shots. And then you had your assault force, and then they moved up, killed it, took everybody out, uh, and then pulled security after just in case there was anybody, you know, were alerted by the fire that started to come in. They could be ready. They didn't just start, like, kicking back and smoking cigars after. Yeah. It Just awesome. Beautiful ambush, beautiful movie like this. It's just so good. Fuck that. Yeah, I did. That's a movement. That's why I couldn't be a sniper. <laughs> I have ADHD. That shit is way too meticulous for me. Yeah. But do you notice what they're doing with the scoop and pull? Mm-mm. So instead of trying to move yourself forward, you're going to pop yourself up higher as you push yourself forward. Yeah. So if, I, if I'm trying to grab with my arms and I push, I'm going to go up and over my elbows, which is going to cause my body to go whoop, whoop, yeah. whoop. So the best way to do it, to not elevate yourself is to scoop the ground in front of you and pull yourself into the ground Mm. so every time they scoop the dirt that's them getting a a handle so then they could pull themselves into it so then they're not lifting their bodies up yeah and you may think oh it's that's cool i would do that if somebody's watching me to stay low but here's the crazy thing is you could be doing that scoop and pull method out in the middle of nowhere nobody watching you right you don't know if somebody's watching you. Right. So you could be doing all this super secret squirrel, tiny movements for hours and hours and hours yeah. for no reason. You could be out there by yourself and nobody's watching you but at all. Just imagine the strain on your body trying to do that yeah. for hours and hours and hours. Like you could look at that and be like, oh, okay, I can scoop dirt and then move forward. It's like, imagine doing that for a really long time. Right. For a I, long distance. I don't see how I would last more than like, honestly, like a straight, let's say 20 minutes seems like a lot. To just for me to do that right now, untrained, un whatever, to do that. So imagine brutal hours and hours of doing that. And that's if you're in an area where enemy are actually watching. The part that bothers me is you could be potentially doing this for no unnecessarily yeah. for hours. And you could be like, find out later, hey guys, you're completely clear. There's nobody by you. Yeah. And you'd be like, son of a. You've just been doing that forever. So you have to convince yourself that it's always necessary. Right. You can't ever assume that it's not necessary. And then in this case, there's a sniper watching him, and he got taken out. So it was necessary. Hmm. But unfortunately, their angle was off from where the sniper was. So their attempts to hide themselves, which would have worked most direction, 360, didn't work for the sniper in the position that he was in. So they just got unlucky. Boss? No, no. I mean, I saw the booklet, but I don't know what's in it. You don't know. You're not seeing like what the drawing was and all that stuff. Mm-mm. All right. So essentially, he's getting to his sniper position, and then before anything happens, let's say he's gonna. He was there a day ago, six hours ago. His job is to start range finding and drawing out that location on his on his uh, pamphlet. Uh huh. So one year, you know. Uh, like if you're doing a overwatch position or if you're doing patterns of life, one of your jobs is to draw sketches. So you're going to draw the area and then you're going to draw major terrain features. So, Hey, this is where at this location, this is where a Creek bed comes in and flows through here. You're going to identify likely travel routes and likely, um, uh, tactical advantages for the enemy 
So once you get to your position, you're identifying all that. Like if you were to attack, I would attack from this location. I would attack from this location. I would crawl through this location, whatever it may be. Um, you know, this is a, a, a main road, an MSR that goes through this location. I'm going to identify that. How far away is it? So then once you start identifying how far away things are, now you start writing those down so you have points predetermined. Yeah. So that way if somebody pops out where you thought, like, let's say there's a water feature here. If they're going to come in and they're walking, they're going to refill their water there. I know from you know scouting my area and checking distances that that's 800 meters away. So now as soon as someone's getting water, I don't have to start – figuring out how where to shoot them from my windage. Right. I know that they're 800 meters. I can set it in my gun. They're at a predetermined location. Bam. I can snap them right. Point aim, point aim. Right, right, right. It's like setting mortars overnight. Exactly. Mm. So all he's doing is setting his distances for each predetermined location where he thinks someone might go through for travel. That's smart. You get a knife kill on the sniper that killed your friend. Oh, nice. You get the blood on the, as the revenge on the statue that your wife made of an angel. Sick, dude. I love this movie. The ultimate revenge. The ultimate get back. It was so, like, gritty and real and, like, I mean, if you think about Ukrainians making this movie right now, like they're making it with a purpose. Like they're really trying to unite their people yeah. for a real cause that is really happening. Mm -hmm. It just adds a level of oomph to it that we only had when we're making movies about Afghan wars or Iraq in the early stages of it. Right. So it's like, in, in to, unless we have that deep connection that like, recent pain mm -hmm. we can't like truly hit the mark yeah and uh, these guys have had this was made with that recent pain in mind and it's just so good all right guys hope you <laughs> enjoy that episode we'll see you on the next one peace